Welcome to Edenwald's virtual event, Declutter Your Space. My name is Allie Watson Fowler, and I'm the marketing coordinator here at Edenwald. I'm just going to go over a few guidelines and introductions for our webinar today. First and foremost, this webinar is being recorded. That recording will be sent out to everyone in attendance at a later date. You'll also be able to find it on our YouTube channel in just a few days. You will notice that the chat feature in this webinar has been disabled. If you have any questions or if you're having any difficulties with the webinar itself, please direct those to the Q&A box, which you will find along the bottom of your screen. Our panelists will answer as many questions as they can after the presentation concludes. We are joined today by Diane Stinchcomb, our Director of Sales. Hello, everyone. Welcome. As well as Debbie Janka, our Senior Residency Counselor. Hello, everybody. Welcome. And now I will turn things over to Edenwald's president and CEO, Mark Beggs, for the rest of our introductions. Hi, and welcome to the presentation today. And, and welcome, Erin. We were having a little technical difficulty, so it's nice that, uh, that she has joined us. Um, so as Ali said, I'm Mark. I'm the president of Edenwald, and I've been here for about a little over three years now. Um, and this is an exciting presentation today. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it's one of our most popular ones that we've ever had. So uh, again, welcome to everybody who's joined us today. I wanted to share a couple of weeks ago, I was actually at a yoga retreat up in Massachusetts and I actually attended a session on decluttering. And uh, this session was focused on, on not only decluttering space, but also what that reflects as far as how we feel mentally and emotionally. Um, and they, they did help us talk through exercises on how to, to declutter our environment, because as you do that, you do start to feel better. So I hope you get a lot out of today. Um, so uh, with that, I only want to do one other thing, which is uh, to just alert everybody on uh, Tuesday, March 22nd, we're going to be making a, a really big announcement. So if you could be watching our uh, social media pages, we're going to be uh, talking about something that I think everyone will find very exciting. Um, not only those associated with Edenwald, but the entire Baltimore community. So, um, so be watching. That's a little teaser I'm giving. So with that, Allie. All right. Please welcome Edenwald's very own move-in coordinator, Erin Marbrooks. Well, hi there. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am, as Allie said, the move-in coordinator for Edenwald. My name is Erin Brooks. I've been here a few short months, but before that, I was uh, a senior move manager. I am um, I am certified as a senior move manager by the National Organization of Senior Move Managers. And um, I did that for about almost six years before I came to Edenwald. So I have experience on this side of the fence, but I also have a lot of experience on your side of the fence. Um, and as much as I love that job, I have someone else here who is I would say uh, an expert in the field of organizing and move management. Uh, joining us today is uh, the lovely Cindy Bernstein. She's the owner of AIM for Order. She is a um, organizational specialist. She's a master in her field and we are thrilled to have her today uh, to lead us through this exciting event. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Cindy Bernstein. I'm gonna turn things over to you now, Cindy, and you can begin today's presentation, Declutter Your Space. You there, Cindy? Thank you. I'm here, thank you so much. I'm gonna start the slideshow. It's very nice to be here, everybody, and you're, we're going to start with declutter your space. Um, and I want to make sure everybody can see it okay. And very happy to be here. And we're going to go through a bunch of slides, a lot of information. Um, and I always tell people, don't worry about taking notes. If you want to get a copy of this, it's my pleasure to share. So don't worry about taking notes. But the purpose of today is really to motivate those of you who would love to move one day, would love to move to a smaller place, would love to move to a beautiful place like Edenwald, but the fear of, oh my God, how will I ever get out of my current home? If that prevents you from looking ahead, I hope today can help you. And by the end of our little talk today, I'm hoping each of you will gain the courage and the confidence 
to get started on this little decluttering journey. It's um, never as bad as what you imagine, I promise. So this is my little sense of humor here, but think if you can relate to any of these things. You have the clothes, shoes, and accessories you've worn to every family event since the 1960s. You love to read books and have the books to prove it. When you go to a special event, you take an extra program or two for your daughter, your whoever, but they haven't gotten their copies yet. You save every card and drawing you've ever received. You have a lot of pictures, some loose, some in albums, some all over the place, and you love to save things because you might need them one day. I know I can't see you, but raise your hand if this is any of you have this in you. And if you do, um, you're in the right place. You're not alone. Um, so next, just to let you know, the, the definition of clutter that was created by one of the very beginning organizers in the industry delayed decision making. So that means that every time you have an item in your hand or you see something and you're thinking, I don't know what to do with this, let me stick it here. Or, oh, I need to call so-and-so and I'll get back to that. This is how clutter starts. We can't make a decision right at that moment. So it kind of gets pushed off to the side. So one of the things that's helpful when you're looking at your own stuff, because it's really, really hard when it's your own stuff. When you're looking at your own stuff, if you can put on this little objective hat and ask as if you're a stranger, ask this questions, these questions to yourselves. Um, say you are cleaning out a junk drawer and you find um, a medallion from somebody's something from years ago. Did you know it was there? Would you miss it if it was gone? If the answer is you would not have even known about this thing or remembered this thing, then that could be an indication that it's okay to let it go. Are there certain things you could take a picture? Let's say your grandchild made you a macaroni art drawing and the thought of packing a macaroni art drawing is not appealing to you because it could draw ants. Could you take a picture of that drawing? Um, could you take a picture of your college diploma if you don't see yourself hanging it in your new home? Um, is there someone that you know that could appreciate the item? Um, most people, if they know it's going to someone that will appreciate it, it's a lot easier to part with it. And we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Um, if something's in really poor condition, you know, say there's a hand needle pointed cushion on a chair and it's starting to fray and yes, your great aunt made it, but is it really in good enough condition to bring it and is it worth the move? So again, we're trying to ask ourselves questions that kind of force us to be honest with ourselves. Um, if I'm saving something because a lot, it belonged to somebody I loved, you know, those of you who have all those crocheted Afghans from great, great aunt, whoever, you know, how many of those do you really need to keep? If you have one that you love, that may cut it, you know, that may be enough. Um, would you buy this item again? That's one of my favorite questions when you have those made for TV products or you have the giant wok that you bought or the bread maker, you know, these things, gee, did I really, was that really worth buying it in the first place? So next we're going to talk about, these are the hardest things that people tend, when they're decluttering, these are the things that really cause the angst. And I'm gonna go through in more detail each one, but this kind of summarizes paper is a big issue, sentimental items, valuable items, clothing, books, and pictures. That pretty much covers everything. Um, but when we talk about paper, and again, we could talk about paper for three days probably, but I'm trying to come up with like the easiest, quickest things that you can declutter without stressing yourself out. And decluttering, I always remind people, it's not about torturing. It's not about making you suffer. It really is like Mark said, it will make you feel better when you have less in your environment. So with paper, things like tax returns, some accountants will tell you to keep three years, some will say seven years, but nobody's going to tell you to keep 30 years worth. So think in terms of which ones are you willing to part with and get shredded. Insurance policies, if you have car insurance, if you have homeowner's insurance, most of those have a start and an end date. So if it's not 2022, you really don't need it unless you have that special homeowners that you keep forever, but that's, that's rare. Um, Old receipts, you know, every time you go to the supermarket, every time you go to 
buy a cup of coffee. Those are not receipts that are relevant um, for the most part. Investment statements. Many people save years and years of investment statements when you may only need to call your investment person and say, do I really need to keep my statements from every year for the last 35 years? And I guarantee they will tell you no. Um, some people feel more comfortable keeping the quarterly statements or the year-end statement, but technically these things are represented on past tax returns. Um, so you do not need those computer generated investment statements. And medical receipts, that when you, if you want to save medical information, most people, it's important to save major surgery dates or blood work dates. But do you need to save the directions to the office? Do you need to save your post-op instructions? Do you need to save your appointment reminders? And that's a lot of what these paper files are full of. Um, as far as daily paper, mail, Newspapers, magazines, notes, and clippings. You know, how many of us cut out articles to give to so and so? Or I had one lady used to save all the comics from all the newspapers because it would make her laugh. Well, how many years of comics does one need? And are you really looking at those and laughing at all 3,000 newspapers you saved? Um, so you just kind of want to put on again that objective hat and be realistic with yourself. Am I really gonna look at this stuff? Am I really gonna remember I have it here? And then have easy to easy access places. So when your mail comes, can you quickly stick it in the recycle box? Can you quickly throw it in your shredder? Um, versus having it on a pile on the counter and then it gets buried. So if you can kind of process it as it comes in each day, then you won't have the stress of the accumulation. A couple of things to ask yourself when it comes to paper. If you had to find the information again, could you? So for example, th those investment statements, if you needed to know how much money you had in March of 2021, I bet you could find that out without going through millions of papers to find that out. Um, Will, will you get rid of old phone bills, old EOBs? Those are the explanation of benefits that you can now actually get online. Um, those kinds of papers take up tons and tons of space in your, in your file cabinets, in some cases on your floor, on your counters, um, up in closets. That stuff, it's like contagious, it just it spreads. Um, expired car insurance, Brochures, you know, how many times have you been to a health fair and perhaps you come home with a bunch of brochures and they just sit in the bag that they came in? Um, so these are just things to think about going through. If you're scared to go in your whole cabinet, pick one file and just see if I'm right about the doctor paperwork that it's directions and post-op instructions. And you'll be like, wow, this isn't hard. I could get rid of this. Um, when it comes to sentimental items, we're talking about photos. And with photos, photos have a life of their own. Want to get started, you would grab a little pile of photos and get rid of the duplicates. Because back in the day, you could get two, three, four copies of the same picture. Blurry ones, scenery, people you don't remember, remember anymore. How many of us have group shots of trips we've been on and we're like, I don't even remember those people um, and anything unflattering. And if you can do all those, you're not gonna have that many photos left, I promise. Um, memorabilia, things like I have in here, do you really need every night's menu from the cruise ship? Those of you that are sentimental, deep, deep feelers, you have a tougher time than the, those of us who just say, oh, nice card, and we pitch it. There are those of you who just treasure these memories. It's very, very hard to part with them, but perhaps you can cherry pick the best of the best. So say you did go on a cruise ship, and you do have all the menus, and you have all the little postcards of the places you went. Maybe you could pick one or two from each cruise and make one book of all your trips. Um, and lastly, with the family heirlooms, the, the, the question I ask people is, what could I not pry out of your hands no matter what? So if something is that special, you'll say, oh, I'm not getting rid of that. 
And you need to feel that with everything that you're going to pack up and move um, because it's expensive to move everything. It's, it's reasonable to move a modest amount. And anyone that's moved, I don't think I have ever, ever heard, and Aaron can, and can probably agree with me on this, no one has ever said, I wish I brought more stuff. Um, so if you can identify the cream of the crop, I think you'll be happier. Um, so with items of value, jewelry, furniture, all these kinds of things, there are places and things you can do with them before you move that will make you feel better, that they're not going in a landfill. Um, there, we're gonna do a few resources, but if anybody gets stuck on this part, please feel free to reach out because this is probably a major cause of stress for people that they just don't know what to do with the things they no longer want. Um, but we're gonna go through a few tips of all these. So with sentimental items, Again, you want to make sure it's worth the space it's taking up. So um, things like gigantic sculptures, gigantic pictures, if they're very special to you, then absolutely keep them with you. But if it's something that you feel lukewarm about, then it might, that's your signal that it might be time to go. So when you are willing to let go, you want to ask family, but I will warn you that um, one of my favorite expressions is no response is a response. So when you keep saying to your family members, do you want my blah, blah, and you don't get an answer or they avoid the subject, their response is no. And then you have to move on to whether you can sell it. And there's all kinds of selling resources, auction houses, estate liquidators, Facebook marketplace. You can do it yourself. You can hire people to do it. Um, there are plenty of charities now that COVID is, has lessened. A lot of these charities are being more open. They're willing to come in your homes again. Um, there are places you can drop off, places that will pick up at your house. Um, for example, I go on to Vietnam Veterans regularly and they show up at my front door. I tell them it's at my front door. It's five to 11 bags. You know, it's pretty easy to guess, just get this stuff to your door. Um, and then when you go through your things, you want to be things like people have treasured letters and treasured things from family, but they've been sitting in dusty boxes for decades. So if you are willing to look at this special stuff, when you look at it and read it, maybe then you're okay to discard it. Or one woman, she looked through all, she had letters from her mother since I think she was in high school all the way up. She read every single letter, cried her eyes out the whole day, but then she wrote this beautiful summary highlighting all the things her mother wrote about. And that summary is what she kept and it made me cry. I mean, it's just beautiful. And this way, you're not just tossing these things out, you're experiencing the love, experiencing the emotion, and then summarizing it. And your next generation of people will be more likely to read that one letter than to see boxes of the other stuff. And I don't want to tell you what they're going to do with it, but you can use your imagination. Okay. Clothing is a little less emotional, but for some people it is more emotional. This is kind of just a humorous little summary of how to decide what clothes to get rid of. Anything with shoulder pads, even if they're making a comeback. Anything with ripped or with holes that aren't supposed to be there. Anything with a weird smell that won't come out. Scarves or belts that don't go with anything you wear. If you ever want to practice, start with your belts because most people have a lot of belts and they never wear any. So that can be a little easier. Guilt items that you spent too much on. You know, how many people have these gorgeous high heel shoes and they couldn't walk in them? Um, you already spent the money. So to have it taking up your space and paying a mover to move them is kind of like punishing yourself more. Unmatched top or bottom of a suit. Anything with a stain that won't come, come out. Super cute shoes that you can't walk in. Dry clean only items that you've washed yourself and ruined. I'm guilty of that. Anything you have to squeeze into or can't breathe in. All righty, books. And I've had people tell me that books, giving away books is like giving away your child. You know, it's people, again, those of us that feel deeply, getting rid of the book is a big deal. 
So with recipe books, typically people that have a lot of recipe books tend to get recipes a couple out of each book. So one thing you could try doing is making a copy of the page with the recipe, get yourself a one binder with one of those, those plastic sheet protectors, and you just put all your favorite recipes in this one little binder um, rather than lug a million recipe books to the new place. Um, some people have their recipes that their mothers or grandmothers have written the recipes and they like to see the handwriting. That's fine. You could put those, put those on one paper into a page protector. It could be part of your binder. Um, and from what I hear at Eden Mall, the food is so good. No one's doing that much cooking, right? Um, paperback books. When you have a lot of paperback books, those do not age well. So if you can pick on those first, they, they tend to collect a lot of dust. They get a little yucky. So paperback books could be a good thing to give away. Um, let go of duplicates. Many people have more than one of the same book. It's kind of funny how that happens. Um, and you want to get rid of any books that you would never read again. Um, my favorite places to donate books to, the Maryland Book Bank is in Hamden. They're, they have a, a, a back dock that's open anytime you can drop the books off. Um, Blind Industries of Maryland, if you have some very special books, they'll actually come and box them up and take them for you. Um, the local libraries sometimes have donation boxes on their parking lot and the giant food store. I know the one in Pikesville has a big box. You just throw the books right in and they get distributed around the world. Um, homeschool families, if you still have your set of encyclopedias, there are homeschool families. There are observant families on the weekends. They may not be using their computer. They love to do their um, looking in encyclopedias for information since they're not on the computer. Um, and with time and space and cost, I've been told that movers charge roughly a dollar a pound. So if you add up the pounds of books you have, that's how much it's going to cost you to move them. Um, so that might help to kind of limit your volume there. Here we go with the family photos again. So when you deal with photos, um, there's all different kinds of ways to deal with photos. The easiest, my favorite, is you just gather them all up, you bring them to the next family function, and you throw them down, and you say, who wants it? And that way, you have people taking photos that will they're choosing to have them. They'll li limit the volume, and you didn't spend 10,000 hours getting them organized. Um, but if you do want to have your photos in good organization so you can pass them along or, or have them for yourself in good order, typically you would gather all the photos from wherever they are. You want to bring them to, hopefully you have a room that you can shut the door because this is not something you can do overnight. And you can decide whether you want your photos to be organized by person who you're going to give it to or chronologically. And I've done it different ways. I've done it where we have folders for each decade when people have pictures and they have no rhyme or reason. You can drop them in hanging folders by the decade, or you can have folders with pers a person's name. I had a bunch of pictures and I just did my aunts, my brothers, my parents, and just had it all. And that's how I knew who was getting what. Um, back to this tossing duplicates, blurry scenery. If you look in a photo album, especially from back in the day before digital, many of the photos in a photo album are the same people in the same outfit on the same day in many different poses. So you have the three siblings standing here, the three st siblings standing by a tree, the three siblings sitting down. So now that you have this courage going on inside and you're being more decisive, you can say, do I really need six pictures of the same people in the same outfit? Hopefully you can pick one. If that's hard for you and the thought of getting rid of your siblings in other poses, then don't do it. Go on to scenery. Um, you don't want to, you always want to start with the easy stuff first because easier will build up the decision muscle and the decluttering muscle. Um, it says, cut the cord with unknown faces. This refers to those of you that have your ancestors in framed pictures in the closet, behind the door, 
um, just stuffed away because you don't know what to do with it and you feel guilty throwing them out. Um, some people have them on the walls and that's lovely. But those of you that don't have it on the walls because you don't either don't want them on the walls, you don't know who they are, no one cares, whatever. And I know that sounds heartless, but there are people who just don't care. Then you kind of hand it to someone, close your eyes, they'll put it in a dark bag and they'll take it away. There's also websites like Ancestry.com, where if you are willing, you can share those kinds of photos online with the hope that somebody in your extended family may know who they are. Um, but the point of the story is these are not things you want to bring with you to your next home because you're not getting pleasure from them. They're kind of just a thorn in your side. Um, worst case, you make your children have them and then they'll get rid of them later. But um, that's always not, not so great. Um, so after you reduce the volume of pictures, then it's your choice to either put them in albums, um, you can scan them. Scanning is, it's, it can be expensive, but at least it's a one-time thing. You scan them and then you can share them on the computer and you don't have to bring boxes of photos with you. Um, there are companies that do this. If anybody needs recommendations, there's some wonderful companies. Um, but it is, you know, it's an investment, but it's an investment that you can share with everybody forever. So that's kind of nice. Um, when you do your photos, you want to just give yourself a few minutes a day or a few minutes a week um, because you can't, you can't do it overnight, but slow and steady progress gets you there. Okay. So next... These are just overall principles and ideas to help you get there. If you say like tomorrow, gee, I don't know what to do. I can't decide what to do. Think back to this list and hopefully you'll find something on this list to do. Um, the things you use the most should get the best location. So when you are standing in your kitchen later today and you're reaching for the bowl that you use to have your salad, and it's like way on the top shelf because you have 10,000 mugs on the easy to reach shelf, you might say to yourself, gee, I don't really use 10,000 mugs. I only use three or four. So you could either remove the other mugs or put them somewhere else because they're sentimental, but have the things you use the most in the best location. If something needs repair, you know, those of you who may have pants that need to be shortened or a bracelet that needs to be fixed. If these things have been just sitting and sitting, it might be time to cut the cord, you know, not throw out your jewelry. You can sell your jewelry if you're not gonna fix it. Um, but make try to make a commitment, even one a week to take care of these loose ends because it will make you feel better. You know, and that's really the purpose of all of this is not to torture you, believe it or not, it's to make you feel more at peace. Um, number three, stop saving stuff for other people or give them a short term deadline. This is a real problem for a lot of people. They want to save it for so and so, but so and so never gets around to getting it. And that's causing stress in your world. Put like things together, which is the only way to monitor volume. So how many people have light bulbs in many different places in their home. How many people have office supplies all over the place? It's the only way to know, do you really need 15,000 staples? Um, probably not. And you probably don't know you have 15,000 staples until they're all together. Um, someone once said, I was asking someone, how many black pants do you need? And they said, no, 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 that's not the right question. It's how many black pants can I squeeze in my closet? Um, when you're moving though, you're not gonna have maybe as much closet space. So you kind of do have to get a little, little tougher on yourself. Sorting plastic containers, getting rid of the damaged ones or the ones without lids. You know, this is an easy, nice place to start because you may have 50 quart size from the Chinese restaurant containers and you may not be making that much soup anymore, or you may not be having that many leftovers. You may be okay with five instead of 50. Um, you may have a giant one that the lid is melted so you can maybe part with it. Tossing old cosmetic samples, that's a lot of fun too. Many people have many things from Clinique and other cosmetic freebies. And believe it or not, these things dry up, they get yucky. 
Um, and if you don't believe me, just take one and open it up and you'll see. Um, but if they are in good shape, but you are not going to use them, there are many, many charities that would love these. They love the little bags because the bags they can put in toothbrushes and, and um, cleaning things for people that don't have homes. Um, so those are wonderful donations. Um, making paper decision as it enters the home. So when today's mail comes, instead of like dropping it on the counter, maybe in while it's still in your hands, you can go recycle, recycle, shred, trash, and just decide each day. Um, set small goals so you can feel proud of your accomplishments. Um, this is something many people do. They'll, they'll shame themselves or, or, or not... Um, appreciate everything they do in the declutter area. So if you do one thing, when you hang up the phone, to, hang up the Zoom today and you get rid of one anything, be proud of yourself because one anything is one thing more than you got rid of, you know, this morning. So whatever you do, it's a win. And if you're feeling frustrated every time you start to declutter, you might need help um, because it's, it can be more fun when other people help you, but you need the right kind of people to help you. If someone's going to stress you out and be like, get rid of it, you know, and, and kind of talk in an unkind way, that's probably not helpful. But if you can partner up with somebody that will be supportive and kind, but firm, that would be a great idea. So let's just pretend you're going to get started in the next few days, okay? When you get started, number one, eat a good meal before you begin, because I don't want you to say, oh, I have a headache, I haven't eaten. Oh, I need my coffee. Oh, I'm starving. Eat first, okay? And then think about, will music or TV help me or will it distract me? So for me, if the TV's on, I'm like kind of watching the TV, but if music's on, it's uplifting. So make it a fun environment. Decide if you're better with a companion or by yourself. 15 minutes is the sweet spot for doing this project because in 15 minutes, your back won't hurt, your knees won't hurt. If they hurt before, I'm sorry, but it won't hurt more um, and you won't get burnt out. So when it's time for you to declutter, you're not going to go into your um, into your basement and say, I'm going to do my basement in 15 minutes. You're going to say, can I do one drawer in my junk room? Or can I do one kitchen drawer? Um, something small and defined so that you don't um, get yourself overwhelmed. You want to put a box at the doorway of whatever room you're in because you want you don't want to run all over the house like, oh, this belongs in the kitchen. Oh, this belongs downstairs. Just put it right by the door so that you don't have to... Um, run all over the house and get yourself tired. And you wanna have clearly labeled bags or boxes so that you don't end up donating the trash or trashing the donations, okay? And I usually tell myself I do white trash for trash bags and black for donation because then you don't remember what you donated because it's in a black bag, okay? And here's your challenge. What can you do in the next three days to declutter a little bit of your home. And if you would be willing to write it down right now on a, anything on your hand, on a piece of paper, something, one thing you can do, and it could be as simple as, let me go to my linen closet and get rid of any sheets or towels that I know I'm never gonna use. You know, I got rid of the king size bed a million years ago, I don't need the sheets, or I no longer need a dehumidifier. Um, but just think of something you can do in the next three days. Um, and what I used to do is have people email me to say they did it. So you're welcome to do that if you want. But main thing is starting is the hardest thing. So if you can start in the next three days and do your 15 minutes, you will be amazed that you did it. And then you'll want to do some more. So 15 minutes a day will have you soaring to freedom. And before you know it, when you keep going, you're going to say, wait a minute, I bet I could move out of this joint. You know, I could move into a smaller, beautiful home and have a lot less stress, have a lot less stuff to take care of. 
and then go have fun. And that's the purpose to me of decluttering is to be able to go have fun, to not be tied to your homes that you've got to declutter or you've got to organize, um, to just go out there and have fun. And starting really is the hardest part. And I'm hoping that today can help you to get started. Um, I'm looking forward to our Q&A session because if you have questions or anything like that, um, I would love to be able to help you and clarify how you can get started and make yourselves feel better. Thank you very much. Cindy, thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, I'd like to maybe touch base a little bit on decluttering for moving. Um, one of the things that I think is good for people to focus on, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, but knowing where your favorite things are going to live once they move into your new smaller space is a great way to rein in your clutter. Um, let's say, for example, you know, you're moving, you're cutting your living space in half and you love, you're a book lover, okay? If you, de if you designate the bookshelf that's going to your house, fill that shelf with the books that you want to come. And then once that books, once that shelf is filled, then you have to decide what to do with the books that aren't going to come. And the same with any of your collectibles, designate a curio cabinet or something like that, where you may say have an angel collection and you want, you have a thousand angels, but you can really only take what's gonna fit in a certain spot. Um, having a clearly defined area of where you're going to put your things is very helpful in the decluttering process. Same goes with clothing. Don't you agree, Cindy? Absolutely. I, I think one of the things that we do as move managers is we like to measure the linear feet of, of hanging space in your new apartment. Uh, if you have 12 closets in your house and you're moving to a house with or an apartment with only three closets, you certainly know that you can't bring 12 closets full of things. But if you know, you have somebody like Cindy do your floor plan, measure your new closet space and say, okay, well, we're working with 20 feet of hanging space. Then you know, you know, in your house, you can bring 20 feet of hanging clothes. Absolutely. Right. Does anyone have any more questions you want to type into the Q and A? We do have one that I will ask, which is, what is the best and most cost-effective way to dispose of an old spinet piano? Good question. Great question. Um, so pianos are one of those things, if you have a fancy piano, those are pretty easy to sell. If you don't have a fancy piano, um, you'll hear horror stories of the, the landfills being filled with pianos. Um, you can pay to have a hauler chop it up and take it away. Um, it's usually what I've had the most luck with is putting it on like a Facebook marketplace or a Craigslist. And I either say it's $10 or I say it's free. For some reason, when you say it's $25 or something, you get more bites because they think it's of value. Um, and it's again, to move it will cost the person several hundred dollars. Um, but begging and asking is probably the best way to get rid of a piano and just word of mouth. Um, most of the local schools and places like that have already been asked. Um, the movers will tell me they have pianos in storage because nobody wants them. But if you really work at it between Facebook Marketplace has a, a, a group that's called Buy Nothing and it's by Geo graphic area. So if you can find, have somebody you know, if you don't know how, a buy nothing group and say, spin a piano, needs a new home, lovingly used and cared for, yours for free if you can take it. Um, you may have luck. And if you don't have luck, then your best bet is to have find the cheapest junk hauler and you call them and you close your eyes and they take it away. Fantastic. All right. Um, so Easy answer to question for, I can answer this one. <laughs> How do we get a copy of these slides? So after the presentation concludes today, this has been recording. 
So we'll edit the recording. Um, we are gonna send out an email to everyone in attendance. So if you're here right now, you're gonna get it. But we're also gonna put it on our YouTube page in just a few days, um, which we will then put a link on our social media. So if you're looking at our social media on March 22nd for our big announcement, you'll be able to find the event link then as well. All right, we do have some questions rolling in. So my husband is having a hard time trying to get rid of his parents' stuff or stuff that someone gave him years ago. He does not use this stuff. We think it's just the memory. What can we tell him so that he is okay to let it go? So clearly it's harder for him. And, and that's just the way some people are wired that it's harder. So you could say to him very kindly and lovingly, honey, um, can we look at it? And you have honey look at it. Um, if there's something that's like tugging at his heart, see if you can take a picture of it and see if that will be good enough. Or if there's like a, a lot of things from one person or two people, ask him, would he be willing to pick five or 10? Um, and just kind of have him pick the cream of the crop. And if that is too overwhelming and he starts getting a little grumpy and I want it all and don't give me a hard time, then the man's not ready. And um, you could also look up the cost of storage and tell him, I hope you really love this stuff because we're going to have to buy a store, rent a storage unit for $300 a month. You know, we can't take it all. Um, but I think it's, if you can gently have him look at it, see what he's willing to take pictures of, see if he's willing to pick some of it as most special. Um, that's probably the best way to, to start. Great, fantastic. How about old furs? That's okay. another good question. So old furs, now of course it's the wrong time of year, but October, November is a good, there's no great time to sell furs because you're never gonna get what you paid for it, but they're, they can be sold on eBay. Um, they can be sold on other um, websites and things. There are certain consignment stores that will take um, furs, um, but it's a tough sale. And, and Ma, I think it's really special if you have grandchildren, you could take that fur and make little teddy bears and give them to each grandchild and you put the little initial on their paw and it's a beautiful, beautiful gift. But if you want to get a little bit of money for your fur, then you can try doing the eBay or finding someone that will resell it for you. Cindy, I'd like to chime in too. A lot of the local theater groups will take them as donations for their costumes department. Um, you can contact the local universities um, who, who put on productions, um, high school plays. They love to have those kind of things in their wardrobes. Great. Those are great ideas. Those are so mm -hmm. cute. <laughs> Okay, so I have a great deal of antique crystal that I cannot use. Is there a special place that we could take to sell it? So there are many places that you can take. Um, it depends, you know, every, it's, everything is always, it depends. Um, but there are auction houses, there are, um, you can, word of mouth is good. Um, if anybody wants to email me, I can certainly send some ideas your way, um, but, um, you again, you have to keep your expectations low because they may have been worth a lot of money back in the day, but they may not be worth that much now. So there's exceptions to every rule and there are things that are very valuable, but locally, I mean, there's Alex Cooper, there's auction, auction places, um, consignment stores. Um, now that COVID has lessened, there'll be more traffic in some of these consignment stores. But um, yeah, those are some ideas and you can always sell it yourself if you want. Um, but if you need ideas, just pop me an email. Cindy, let's talk about this perceived value versus real value. It's um, an issue that a lot of declutterers uh, come across because people tend to believe that their things are more valuable than the marketplace will allow them to be. Um, you do a, a bit of selling on eBay. I know your husband does. What do you have to say to people who have maybe thousands and thousands of dollars perhaps invested in Beanie Babies or Precious Moments or Snow Babies? You know, they're just not. 
worth not it. doing it. Yeah. Uh, I can attest to Beanie Babies. Yeah. We had at one point we had 850 Beanie Babies to sell for someone. And I think we donated 830 to local charities because they just don't sell. Um, so one quick way, if you have something and you are convinced of, that it's valuable, you can go on ebay.com, E-B-A-Y.com, and you'll, you type in your item and you'll see it but that's what people want to get for it. If you want to see what it actually sells for, you click on a little button that says sold. Um, and then you'll see in green, in green ink that it's sold for $9.99 or it's sold for $12.34. And then that's kind of a wake up call that it's, you know, you can't fight reality. Um, but if you can find a nice place to give it to, um, you know, there are, um, shelters where abused women go for protection and those children have left their homes with nothing. If they can get your precious Beanie Babies, that's a feel good thing. Um, so it's kind of the reality of if more than one person tells you this is not, you're not going to get this money. It, it's just not selling. The market is flooded. Listen to that and then find a good cause that'll make you at least feel like somebody's appreciating your things. Them. All right. We have a lot of questions coming in now. Um, how about suggestions for disposing of 35 millimeter cameras? Well, funny, some 35 millimeter cameras are actually worth decent money. So you can look them up on eBay. You can take them somewhere for another opinion. Um, but if you're absolutely sure they're of no value, you could just donate them because there are camera people out there, photography clubs. Um, there's a young man who works with recovering drug addicts and they specialize in photography. So I've given a lot of stuff to them. Um, so there are good causes. You can also Google what to do with 35 millimeter cameras. And I bet you there will be resources on that Google search. Awesome. Okay. So what percentage of clients who after decluttering will still need additional public storage for which they would have to pay out of pocket? Well, the people that I work with, we really, really try not to do public storage. The only time we would do public storage is if someone is waiting for their new home to be ready and they have to put it in storage for a month or two. Um, but I personally would, would not encourage um, that. And I'll tell you a quick little story about almost two years ago, we, someone was moving to Florida. The sons wanted to put all her things in storage. Fast forward $3,600 later, they now just paid several thousand dollars to empty out the storage unit. Nobody wants anything. Their mom unfortunately passed away. Um, this could have been done two years ago, but they weren't ready. So it's storage is an expensive, expensive answer when you're just not ready to make a decision. And that's really what it is. So it's hard to say percentages. I just think it's not. If you can avoid buying storage, I would do that at all costs. I'd like to echo that, Cindy. Um, as a move manager, we always discouraged anyone from getting storage unless there was an end game. Um, because basically what happens many, many times, and as Cindy just said, is the value of the things that you have in storage is diminished by the uh, price that you pay to keep it there. And eventually it's outlived its value. And at nine times out of 10, nobody wants anything that's in there anyway. But if you have an end game for it, if you know that it's just a temporary situation, um, then it's not a bad idea, but we highly discourage getting storage when you're downsizing because you're not really downsizing. You're just delaying the problem for the next generation. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's my cousin once joked that he he had a ten thousand dollar coffee table because his daughter wanted this coffee table and then she never got it. And he spent ten thousand dollars in storage fees. Oh, my gosh. He so. once had a client that was spending twelve thousand dollars a year on storage units and for, de oh for a decade. Yeah. So it's easy to forget you're paying it and it's easy just to ignore it. Right. OK. Um, what is an easy way to dispose of green plants? Green plants that are live, there that again would be a perfect thing to put on one of those free websites. 
Um, and you could even have a little table outside because people that love plants are rabid about it and they will come and get your plants. That's a great suggestion, yeah. <laughs> How about old records? Are old records sellable? So some old records are sellable, Miles Davis, the Beatles, you know, there are certain ones that are very sellable. Um, they could sell for $30, $18. There's a guy in Hamden who has a used record store and you can bring them in and he'll give you cash for whatever ones he wants. Um, that's probably the easiest. There's another one called Cash for Music. And I believe if you have enough, they'll come to your house. Um, but if you don't have anything spectacular, you can just take them to Goodwill or any of the nonprofits out there. Fantastic. So does anyone have any additional questions? It seems like we're wrapping up here. That was our last question. I do have a suggestion in the Q&A that maybe would be helpful for our attendees. Um, someone suggested that um, replacements.com will sell a lot of old stuff. If you're looking for somewhere to sell your random stuff, that might be a good solution for you. Um, but I don't see any more coming in. So I would like to turn it over to Diane Stinchcomb briefly to just wrap it up for us today. Thanks, Allie, and thanks, Cindy, thanks, Erin. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. We really appreciate it and hope you got some good ideas on how to move on to your, to your next new home. Uh, just to let you know, we are open for in-person appointments if you'd like to call us for any additional information or to schedule a time to visit. Our number is 410-823-1349. You can also uh, find out more about Edenwald. We are on uh, YouTube, YouTube, cha YouTube channel, Edenwald Senior Living. We are on Facebook also as Edenwald Senior Living. So again, we wanna thank you all for joining us and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Take care and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, thank Allie. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Bye. Bye-bye.